I paint better under a bit of pressure. Is that true though? I genuinely feel like I paint better when I'm under pressure. I think maybe you tell yourself that. There's such an obsession in this hobby with like speed and almost like minimizing the amount of time that you're doing it. The last five years of painting for me has been a lot of like putting unnecessary pressure on myself. How can I find this thing I love relaxing when I've got that in the back of my head? Painting update, how's everyone's week been? James? <laughs> That's good. It's good. The old uh, Mulganuary is is happening quite well. Um, you can't just change the name. I think it's appropriate for the character. Of course I can. Yeah, but no, Bealtanuary Biel was supposed to encompass all of Eldar. Yeah. So it yeah. still fits it's within Bealtanuary. It's still Biel Elder appropriate because yeah, it's yeah. Mulgan. Yeah. Annuary. It's just a branding conflict. That's all. We're trying to push hashtag Bill Tanuary. I got, I it's got, not a branding got, conflict. It's oh, James deciding that sorry. he's going to... I've I, got I, something on this. I've got something on this. And he actually, he's fixed, he fixed it before I got a chance to mention it. So I'm a bit annoyed because I was going to, I was going to beef, I was going to bring some beef to the podcast, right? What you got? I'm vegan, mate. No beef. He did a post the other day on your painting thing. You were painting... Uh, Malgam Ra, which yeah. is what you're about to go into, I suppose. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. Bill Tanuary, Malganuary, or whatever. And he like tagged me in it. I assume he tagged you in it mm -hmm. as well. Um, like in the story. I was like, oh, cool. Like, whatever. Like, I had a look at it, laughed, whatever, because he said about that. Wasn't following me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize that was the case. James wasn't <laughs> following me. Yeah. I've got to say this. You had do, the audacity, <laughs> had the audacity to tag me in a thing, has messaged me multiple times. You've been friends via, for years. Via Instagram. Wasn't following me. Siege was following me. I always get a little reply to my stories from Siege. Can I just, can I just say something? So you, you have two accounts. I do have two accounts. Yeah. I follow your other account. <laughs> So, I have my personal hang on, account. Hang on, <laughs> live on air. We'll do it. There we go. Hang so on. I wanted no, to call him no. out. I wanted to call him out on the podcast, but randomly the other day, he just started following me. Oh, I fixed it, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, you've already oh, fixed right. it. Okay. I'll, just, I'll just unfollow you now. Then you, you again, you've then. already fixed it. There we go. Right. Okay, done. That's done. <laughs> Didn't follow me. Outrageous. Outrageous. I'm sorry. Still that tagging me and stuff, messaging. And do you know what? I messaged you. I replied to one of your stories or something. Yeah. And it never even came up like seen or whatever. Because mm. I, be, I was getting relegated to the requests, weren't I? Because it wasn't following <laughs> me. That's mental, wasn't it? You should have done it from your other account. It'd yeah, I should have done it from my personal account. I could message anyone from my personal account. Yeah, yeah. I only clocked onto that the other relegated day. Relegated to the requests. And then yeah. I got, and then I got a, a following notification. I will accept some blame in that it's a new account. It's also the Excuse second. me, it takes two to tango. Are you it, following me on is it? it? I'm following you. Oh, okay, fine. That's I'm following right. you. Oh, I'm yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think. Yeah, I, we'll cut this if I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it. While, while we're talking about follows and things like that, I also brought some 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 vegan beef to the table. Uh, not that exists, but um, I got a friend request the other day on Facebook. I think. Um, are we not friends on Facebook. I don't. I don't <laughs> use fake, Facebook. Or is it a fake account? No, no, no. That was me. I don't use Facebook. And then, like once every like six months, I'll open Facebook, and it will have like load of like you know friend recommendations or whatever i'll yeah. just go through i'll do my little it just comes up with people that you little follow annual update so you Instagram knew that much. we weren't and you just randomly done it when it appeared no no, no. Yeah. i didn't uh, i didn't know that we weren't i didn't even know if we were it never even crossed my mind because i don't horrendous. use facebook anyway, I, just I don't it. yeah to be fair like facebook I, i'm i'm hardly on there now I, don't, I i i've i wouldn't know who i'm friends with on there and who i'm not to be fair but uh i think we're friends on we we must be I'd hope so. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> I'll be getting another, another, another kick in next week. Yeah. Uh, no. But yeah. Anyway, circling back round to your painting, I've, I've yeah, done my so, call out now. So, Mulganuary is is definitely underway. Um, but it's Bill Tanuary. Let it go. It means all Eldar. All right. You haven't got to take every single thing that we do and try to make it like just to be difficult. I feel like he does it on purpose. It's not. It fits with his name. It's like, that's simple. It's and annoying that it fits, though. It, it is annoying that it, it fits, fits with his name. It. If it didn't fit, I wouldn't have thought it up and used it anyway. Um, yeah, so I, I have added a bit more to him since uh, since the story, which I tagged your account, which I don't, we're not friends <laughs> in or whatever it was. But yeah, um, yeah, I've added a bit more to him. Uh, it, it just needs a lot of work on the armor, really. Um, just add a bit more interest with colors and some tones and things. But um, yeah, there's a few gems and things to do. Uh, and the base, which I'm going to leave last. But I know what I'm doing with the base now because I was a bit uncertain because I just blocked it in with the color. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I've, I've got a plan now for the base that will work with the colors and things. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I've, I've can't wait to finish it. I've got only a few. I've got this weekend, I think, coming up to finish it. So, so that will be my weekend in and around other bits and bobs. You know what? I've got a bit of beef actually as well. Oh, oh God, we're not done with this. Oh, Here everyone jumping on the bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I brought my Bill Tanyere model into the office to like show everyone because it's been finished for about yeah, a week. Just to show off because George has finished really early. That's, like, ne- that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Anyway, show James, and he's like, "Oh yeah, would have done this, would have done this, would have done that." And I'm like, "Remind me, remind me where yours is, because correct me if I'm wrong, James. <laughs> you've been painting yours for about six months. <laughs> I've had other things to paint, mate. So I've been painting other things. We always say you want feedback. Yeah, like, exactly. You're gonna get if you want to improve, you need feedback. And oh, yeah, let's see your model then. Get, yeah, you will yeah. after the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been painting mine as well. Um, I had a bit, I don't know what I, what I touched on last time, if I'd done it yet, but I mentioned to you, I think after the episode, because you mentioned about sanding your robe back down and, and redoing things where you were doing your freehand that you weren't happy with and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And uh, I had a similar kind of issue with, I just hated the green that I'd gone with and I felt like I could just carry on, but I'm not going to be happy with it. Um, just colour choice. Yeah, like color choice and also just specifically the paint. Like I was using a Tamiya paint, which incredible with the airbrush. That was going on lovely. But then it was just like a nightmare to, I like. I still like, even though I was doing it quite airbrushy, I still like to kind of reinforce the transitions and stuff and the colors with a brush after. Um, and I just wasn't having a very good time doing that with, with the Tamiya paint, to be honest. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to stick to what I know. I kind of sanded it back down a little bit. <clears throat> Also, I had some of the issues with those gaps on the side, so it helped me like go back in a little bit on those. Um, and uh, yeah, I, kind of redone it. I thought you were going to say you had thorn envy. Oh, I'm not going anywhere near doing thorns. I'm not doing that. I'll put that out there now. We've got like we've got like a pact on the thorns. It's yeah. like I won't do it if you don't do yeah, it, and then neither yeah. of us look bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a solid weekend of painting. Actually, got quite a lot of it done. Got a lot of the lot of the robe done. It's just like the small details to do now. The base is done. Um, it's technically not a black base rim. Te- on a technically, it, what is technically? It's either black or it's not black. Um, it's like a really really dark grey. So it's not look, black. It kind of looks black, but it's not black. This is like a it's like Lego Batman. It's like only working black. Very, very dark grey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, do you know what? I just couldn't find like, since we've had those conversations, like all jokes aside, it's like annoying me to look at base rooms now. <laughs> like I'm like annoyed at like whatever one I can come up with or whatever basing I come up with, I'm convinced that like the base room that I'm choosing doesn't look right. But, um, and I think I was going a bit lighter on the, the kind of gravel and stuff. It's like an urban base, but I went a bit lighter than I normally do. And then I did the black base for him and I was like, oh God, he's right, isn't he? <laughs> um, Vindicated. So for what, very, is this the fifth, fifth week in a row? Very dark, very dark gray. Can, can, can we please, please, for the love of base rims, put base rims to bed. Like, I'm just saying. Base no, rims saying. is so last season. Like, come on. <laughs> I'm just the saying. Prime, prime is the new, oh, the new what, thing. Do you know what? I had to, um, I, I had to strip the head. I just had to strip it. I I had some horrible like texture on the white that I was just like, I don't know what to do with it. Like I don't know how to get out of this. So I I had it as a sub assembly and I stripped it. Just like a bit of a bit of bio strip. Um literally like literally two minutes in bio strip because it was just a little head. And on your note of the spray on primer, Mm -hmm. I would have to say easiest model stripping i've ever done in my life because it's clearly not like doesn't as, stick doesn't as stick, as stick. Yeah. but but it's not that it hasn't stuck there's but there's been no issue with painting with it mm. and i love that it's a primer but it's such a thin layer like the the amount of detail that's still there i've never had a problem with paint sticking to it i just find it's not durable yeah same yeah yeah so I guess I don't know where I'd run into that issue then because if I've already painted it, painted over it and I'm painting over it fine and then I'm varnishing the model and mm-hmm. whatever. Um, but yeah, stripping it, easiest paint stripping ever because it just come out. It was like, it was like literally like a new model. <laughs> mental. Nice. Um, so potential positive to the spray on primer there, I think, to the, to the airbrush primer. It's like a, we need a new acronym for temporary primer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, this week we had a bit of news. Uh, walk on. So there's a new Brightonian that's not new. It's actually very old, but they've released it out of the archives. Did old, you read this? Old but new, yeah. It's Doc from Back to the Future in model form. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, for, uh, because of being old but new. Old but new. Old but new I, yeah. didn't, I thought you were saying he looks like it. No, 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 no. Doesn't look like him. I'm, glad, I'm glad that that wasn't the avenue he's going. Now, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I thought it was quite interesting actually. The idea of I wonder how many models are sort of sat around in the uh, in the archives over at GW, just waiting for the waiting for their day. I think it's interesting, specifically that it was on show at one point. Like they displayed it at a show, the sculpt, and. Um, like, so someone could have seen it and like really liked it at the time and then just never seen it again. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't feel like that's something we have now. I feel like I went, if we see a model at a show, it's either already been fully announced or... I think so, yeah. I, I went to uh, a lot of the game days and I can honestly say this, I do not recollect that model at all whatsoever. Because I remember they used to have like screens on show sometimes. They used to have stuff on show sometimes. Um, but I don't remember that model at all. Um, so yeah. it, was, it, was actually, it was actually really nice kind of like oh wow I, 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 it's not, it just shows how broad the range of models for all games is even now as you say we still go on games workshop sometimes when we're looking for models and stuff and you just see something like, I've never seen that before but there's an extra layer of depth it's like it's like the the uh, the basement of of or like unknown models is 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 still there yeah uh, which is it's, good. It, like I remember in, for the more modern shows so like the fest the last fest that was at Coventry, yeah, they had a lot of the like, uh, like the free ups on show and stuff like that, and that's really cool. But they were all models that were already out, mm. so it wasn't like, wasn't like this. I, I, what I'm getting at is, I don't think this is necessarily something that would happen again. Like, I don't think you never know what they've they, got. You never know what they've yeah, got. Yeah, but I don't think that they're, they're not putting those things on show anymore. No, so, so it's like we definitely this, don't see like pre-release stuff, and even. Even with like Forge World stuff that was resin, they often would have like most of the time it'd be painted, right? Yeah, or or it'd be an, it would already be announced on Warhammer Fest or something. So it's like it's cool that this is happening, and it's cool that it's like it's not something that's going to happen again, really. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. it, it's a cool little thing. Although it does like compared, it shows it does show how far the technology's come as well. Because when you put it next to the new models, it's not like it like seamlessly fits in. I find it interesting looking at old models that there's sort of like almost this, um, the cutoff is kind of only like eight years ago where there's almost like this distinct jump in quality. Because I feel like the quality of miniatures between like the 90s and like the mid 2010s or whatever were like, they were better, but they weren't massive jumps. And I feel like what we have now, even compared to only like eight years ago, like the quality jump is huge. Yeah. I guess it's also just the different style because it's, it's obviously hand sculpted. No, I get that, but I just feel like the technology is just like hit this massive acceleration mm. that maybe wasn't the case. You're always going to get a better model, a sharper, more refined model with CAD. Like hand sculpting it is, is great and you have someone who's extremely talented. You can get a very, very sharp, refined model, but it, I don't think you'll ever get a like for like comparison to digital. Digital is great. I'm kind of like in the middle. I kind of like both. I like the 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 skill and effort and time and 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 what is actually what it actually takes to create a hand sculpted model. Um, I've got. I'm fortunate to have some of the um, some of the uh, resin masters or the, some of the masters. I found an eBay seller that had some of the old masters of some of the metal models, uh, and they were selling them. And I've got like the Lamartis uh, and a couple of other uh, librarian models of the Mastercast, which is like the, the it's a resin. Same color as like Finecast, but it's not Finecast, if that makes sense. It's what they used in the design studio. Um, and they were hand sculpted and the quality of those is crazy. So it just shows you how refined like a CAD uh, designed miniature actually is. Well, not CAD, but, you know, the computer designed one is. Um, but yeah, you're right. That new Bretonian Lord, you can see its age, but I think it's it's kind of good. It's a nod to the past, which I, which I'm, I, look, it, I, it, I think, it, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Like I'm not saying... I think it's just cool. Like if you're getting that model, you're getting it because of the story and everything, right? Like there's, it's not like it's like going to be the only Bretonian Lord you can get. So like if you're choosing to get that one, you either particularly like the model or you're getting it because of that story behind it. I think Same cool. reason people like to use like um, old metal models as a proxy for models that have even got like new sculpts now, right? 
Yeah. Nostalgia. Massively all about nostalgia. So in a continuation from uh, from last week, mm-hmm. we had a little bit of a little bit of a debate, didn't we, about the whole sharp knife versus blunt knife. Oh, here we go. In terms of the mold oh, line removal. Here we Just go. for anyone, because we obviously like only a certain amount of people make it through the entire episode. If you didn't listen to the full last episode. Shame. Uh, please, <laughs> please go back. And li- like pause this. We'll we'll still be here. Go back, listen to the la- like the hobby hack of last episode. Because these two were like absolutely, it was the last episode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they were absolutely like on another level of like just trying to get their point out, like so excited, so opposed to each other. No, I did actually say, I just want to point out before you you deliver what you're going to deliver in some kind of like attempt at a hammering victory, which it isn't. Um, that I did say. I mean, it I is, also, but we'll get to that. I also <laughs> use a sharp knife. They're as doing well. it again. Yeah, they're doing so, it again. <laughs> Just okay, so well, we put a poll out after that episode to ask the listeners if they prefer. <laughs> Sorry, we. <laughs> George, George put a poll out. I put a poll out last week uh, in, in response to that to see what the listeners thought. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, James, 84% of people agreed that. Come on, the blade. 16%. Yes, <laughs> come on. Like, no, I, I love that he takes that as the W. He's like, yeah, yeah, 16% of people agree with me. Yeah. Still good. Still nearly a fifth. It's good. Uh, I still I still use a uh, uh, sharp blade for some things, and I still use a blunt blade for both. I was just pointing out that my go-to typically is a blunt knife because I find it I just be a bit more careful not taking off too much with it. Jokes uh, aside, it is actually interesting how people can use basically the same tool in very very different ways, right? Mm, and like yeah. everyone, I, it's not like I look at one of James's models and go, "Look how bad the mold lines are." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, because they never are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why yeah, was, was that one of his critiques of your Biotanuary model was no. he like oh the mold lines aren't quite uh, taken off oh no because I use a sharp blade so the mold <laughs> lines were just precision removed George, George was, it was squeaky clean it was good mm, yeah. nice. no thorns eh? we won't we won't talk about that <laughs> uh, so this is in a continuation of the primer which seems to be the new that's the new, new base rim, rim. new yeah. base rim I think I said that last last episode yeah, yeah. It's, it's the new that. it's the new hot topic of uh, of 2024 uh, Nibe Stilgar says, uh, no, 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 automotive primers destroy miniature primers in every way. So I thought this was interesting. We spoke kind of anecdotally. <laughs> the point we were trying to make was that using primers for, that are designed for being used on miniatures, and we like in passing mentioned not using ones that are designed for like car. And I meant like body filler and stuff. But uh, there was a lot of people, this wasn't the only comment, there was actually quite a few people I saw a uh, Rooting for the automotive primers. So. The thing is, the thing is with this, I've never, I've tried them before and didn't really see any benefit or negative, if I'm honest. If, if I was maybe being a bit more observant, I probably would have been able to pull some negatives on it because of just being a bit thick or something. But I think just on the facts of it, you've got to acknowledge that they're obviously designed for something completely different. So it's likely that they're not going to, so even if you, you found one that worked well, I'd say there's probably a miniature painting one that works better because that's what it's designed for. But not only that, I'm but arguing. like if you're buying a miniature painting one, odds are it's going to be fine. But if you might, you're looking for like the one in 10 automotive primers that yeah. happens to work. Well, I, I, I think it's just a, a favorite thing of people because it, it, it's kind of one of the most typical, like classic, if you like, I say classic, like say in the last like five years or something like YouTuber suggestion to like, save money and get one over on like people charging too much money for miniature painting products. You know what I mean? It's like one of the original ones that I remember seeing when I got back into it of like, yeah, you don't need to buy games workshop sprays. You can just, you can just like uh, use the Halfords. Or something. I think that got lost a bit as well. Cause me and you don't use GW sprays. I think people thought we were specifically no. sticking up for the GW cans, but I don't, I don't use GW I cans don't. rarely ever. Yeah, I don't. The reason why car primers like destroy against miniature primers is because of the thickness of the paint that goes on. They're designed to cover a car panel. Like car panels are massive. They don't have tiny, minute little skulls everywhere or other little details and things. Every time I've used uh, or tried a car primer or Halford's Grey, which is very, very common, and I've heard this on classes and one-to-one sessions and whatever, blah, blah, people have tried it and gone, oh my God, I put way too much paint on the miniature. Car primers are designed to prime cars. They're not designed to prime miniatures. You could, I'm not saying you should prime, and vice versa. You shouldn't prime a car with a miniature primer. It's just not as strong as a as a, as a car primer for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, 
but yeah, like I, I've just personally found them to be really, really like thick for miniatures. They're great spray cans. I'm not going to deny that at all whatsoever, but they're just not suited for the task. It's all about really what is the best tool for the job. Um, and I, I've always just found the, the cans that are made by manufacturers that work within the miniature industry to be better. That said, though, like much like the sharp versus blunt scalpel blade thing, like one thing that works for someone else might not work for another. So just because we're yeah, saying not yeah. to use them, if yeah. you use them and they work well, then use them. Like, yeah, by all means. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm I'm now team Vallejo airbrush surface primer, so I, I'm I don't have a he's on his own for that. I, don't have a I find in, I find that interesting because in me and James have spoken only a couple of weeks ago about how we don't like using that. Yeah, yeah, that's why I started using it. um no literally i started using it just because weather outside the weather at the minute yeah Yeah. and then i thought oh do you know what i've got a thing of it like i didn't buy it specifically i just had one and i was like oh do you know what i'll just give this a go and see what it's like i think i saw a tutorial not too long ago where someone used it and i was like oh yeah like i haven't really seen anyone really talk about that anymore um just had a really good experience with it so i'm finding that generally speaking i kind of just prime in all weather like we've given some tips yeah. before about how you can like warm the cans up but i think this is the first like winter in a while where it's been so cold that i'm having like serious problems with with spray mm-hmm. cans there you go vallejo yeah. surface primer yeah they're not sponsoring this i keep saying the full like branded name. <laughs> big news tickets are now on sale for the siege studios painting classes for 2024 For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class scene. Uh, Canto Hammer says, one piece of advice someone once gave me for getting a good color combination is to look at flags of various countries around the world. The logic is that no country would use a set of colors that clash in their flag. Turns out my space marines might be from Bermuda. You can also <laughs> use animals. Uh, my Tyranids use colors of various crab species like king crab, blue crab, and vampire crabs. I've never thought of that, but that's great. That's a great answer. That's a great idea. I'll have to uh, add some country flags to my, uh, my 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 journal so that I can use those as a reference for projects in the future. Yeah, I, I um, I've heard this a few times before. We're like picking color combinations and stuff. Specifically, the Tyranids like crabs. Yeah, the coconut crab. crab yeah, like yeah. the for like anything that's insecty. I know Eric pulls a lot. Like one of the painters on the team pulls a lot from like when he's painting Frogs like and stuff. skinks and things yeah. or like Skaven or whatever. He'll pull from like real species lizards that's a throwback yeah that if, well actually eric painted some of the models on the uh tyranids episode a while back and you can see some examples of that there um so is that you just trying to sneak in the old tyranids are based on lizards rather than someone did like subtly comment something to prove you right about that a while ago i didn't really take any notice yeah, of the it. listeners always come through for me they've got my back i didn't really take any notice of it i just yeah, scrolled past think, it think... but i'm sure someone I remember reading it and going, yeah, good point. Anyway, next we'll, have, we'll have to do some due, due diligence on a couple of those couple of those comments and see where the account's based and how yeah. they're yeah. out, I think. It's one of, not going to be one of James's old accounts again. <laughs> so you logged into Pearl's account. <laughs> yeah. uh, Parker Butyinski 500 says, so I know this goes a little against the don't get wrapped up with specifics or tools that others use, but I'm curious what a painting journal looks like as far as a product. Is it just standard notebook or is there a better direction for one? Hmm. It's a very good question. Yeah. All I'm going to say is watch your space. That's literally all I'm going to say. Well, we could probably, we'll probably have to leave it there. I don't think we can say much else. Uh, DMO Traz says, uh, didn't catch it in any older episodes, but have you ever discussed sculpting mini parts? Most of your sculpted commission pieces are top tier, and I'd love to hear a conversation with, or at least about, whoever does your sculpting. So the sculpted parts that you've seen, or sculpted things you've seen, uh, are the custom service one-off bespoke models which we do for clients. Um, they are one of ones, so we just make that one for that for that individual for that client, and then don't do any more of that miniature uh, again, uh, or the same as that one. Um, but with sculpting, um, it's a very different medium of creating interest on a miniature. Um, obviously, painting and adding adding the paint onto a miniature is one format, but um, 
sculpting, you, if you think painting takes a lot of time, sculpting, I, from my experience a bit, which is very limited compared to a lot of the, the, the customer service team members that we've got here at Siege, sculpting is like turning up to 11 and the, the amount of work and effort that goes into it is, is considerable. Um, you're working with a totally different medium. So it's a medium that you have to conform and shape, um, add interest to it, add texture to it, add hard edges to it. Um, it's totally different from painting. You're actually creating that detail. But I think one of the beautiful things about sculpting, just, just from, from the limited experience that I've got and from some of the things I've seen that the custom service team have done is that it's really good when you tie in the thought process behind the detail that you're create, creating and then also add on thinking about how it's going to be painted. So when you combine those two things, that they really help each other to create something which which complements both aspects of what we're trying to execute when we do something like that. I think so, that's one of the most interesting parts of it. Uh, actually, on that note, when we do a custom service commission, so also just in case people don't know, like sculpting is as much of its own thing to the point where like we have a separate so custom service is a separate team. Yeah. The is, sculptors yeah. is a separate team of sculptors. Yeah. A lot of our painters can sculpt just fine. Like, but they're obviously good at sculpting. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, they were good at painting. Sorry. So I wouldn't take George and send him a whole custom sculpted thing that he has to do. Please don't do that. Um, so yeah. So that's how much of like, it's, it's almost its whole own hobby. Like most is, of yeah. them do paint as well, yeah, but yeah. they obviously focus on sculpting and, sculpting, and yeah. that's what they've spent their time perfecting kind of thing. But when I allocate a job to them, um, if a client's come to us, obviously they're getting the custom sculpted models. They're also getting it painted by us. Yeah, so yeah. they'll get it painted by, um, a different, like one of the painting team. Yeah. Um, for the spec that the client fills out, they fill out the full thing. So they fill out the sculpting spec and the painting spec. And then when I send that to the sculptor, they see the painting spec as well. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of to your point of like knowing how something that's going to be painted can. Um, well, it really helps steer, it helps steer kind of like the direction of the sculptor a little bit in some areas, because like, let's just say they were choosing to do a certain piece for the detail. If there was a corroborating bit of painting information, which had some information, which would the, the sculptor can look at and go, actually, I, cause I know it's going to be painted like that it's probably better for yeah. me to do it this way or curve this this way or do this this way or make the pose this way so that it's more accessible or things like that. It's like, yeah, yeah it's quite, it's really, but both those things harmonize really well together and, and there, there needs to be that perfect synergy to to, 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 to make the models that we create. You know? It also goes the other way, like the painter gets to see the sculpting instructions because yeah. that can be helpful sometimes as to like, okay, so they've put this there because the client asked for this, Correct. this, and this. So yeah. maybe there's not a specific painting because the clients also filled the painting out before they've seen the, the final model. Yeah. Sometimes there'll be specific little parts that maybe aren't covered in the painting spec, but if they go back and see why those things have been sculpted there, that helps. Yeah. But yeah, it'd be cool to maybe get, um, get a sculptor on and, and have that kind of chat. Cause I feel like that's something that is like completely foreign to a lot of people. I don't know if, I mean, I definitely, <laughs> I would coast through the episode, but I don't know if you both have enough ex experience or not to have a full I'm, episode I can't on that sculpt, yourselves. Can't sculpt to save my life. I'd actually be interested to hear from from them. I I do see it exactly like you said. It's almost like at this level of skill, it's like its own thing. Yeah, like exactly. you said, like the sculptors are incredible sculptors, and they've just honed in on that. And like you said, a lot of them do paint, but like that's their thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like for me, I'm never going to be a good sculptor, so I've, I've honed in really hard on the painting. And luckily, there's other people to not to job. as well. There's, there's certain there's some members of the custom service team that are also like obviously the, the people that you're extremely jealous of, where they can like sculpt these incredible models, and then also they're on the painting team as well because yep. they're such good painters. Like, and they're winning golden demon and stuff like that. It's like. It is almost its own thing. And that's why it's so crazy when you see these big competition winning pieces where things have been completely hand sculpted. Mm -hmm. That's enough of an impressive thing. And then it's painted to the level that would win Golden Demon. It's like, yeah, absolutely insane. But yeah, I suppose maybe between us, we don't have enough uh, expertise. It'd just be us asking James stuff. And then James being like, I, I, um, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I sculpted some blood drops. <laughs> I can do I can do a few little bits and bobs, but nothing super crazy. So I can do like repose legs, put the put the plastic rubberized armor back in, or a purity seal here and there. Maybe a, a redo the toe or whatever. 
Um, but other than that, like, yeah, you you look at wings and aquilas and things like that. I'm just like, yeah, no way. Yeah. But, yeah. Maybe we all need to go on one of the C Studio sculpting classes that are happening throughout the year. Yeah. Hmm. I've heard they're quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Good tell, Matt. Uh, Faces and Bases says, long-term listener, recognize mm-hmm. the name. Uh, another great show to kickstart the year and absolutely love the tips and advice. Uh, I think there's a real benefit from people sharing their mistakes and things to avoid rather than just the perfect end product. Maybe a fail brewery. <laughs> uh, intrigued to try varnishes is a medium in my paints uh, to change the properties. Absolutely great tip. There you go. Yeah. Um, that's... It's kind of what we were going for with the last episode, right? We wanted to touch on, I personally, when I'm learning something new, um, I like to hear what people did wrong rather than necessarily what people did right all the time. It's that classic trope of like you learn from your mistakes, not your successes. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So yeah. we thought that people might benefit from some of our mistakes. Um, quite a good reaction overall, actually. So it probably did the trick. I think as well, it's like we live in this age of everyone just showing their best all the time, especially with like socials and that. And I do think it is nice to see the other side of it and not it's it's so disheartening to see like incredible stuff over and over and over again but people strategically don't show you the problems they had along the way right just not not ne- not that that's necessarily an ego thing like fair enough like everyone shows a bit like my, same with my instagram like i just show like my photos of my finished stuff because that's all i want to share but i like to talk about and unpack all the problems on like these episodes uh, yeah yeah joe you're like this we've had a new review oh on, thank uh, god i've been waiting iTunes. for a new review uh, we don't. We keep asking people. Please, please leave a review <laughs> for this podcast on uh, iTunes or Spotify if you listen to the show every week. If you've got to this point of this episode, surely you can go and leave a review. You can go and leave a review. Like we, we every week, we're like, we got a new one yet. Yeah. We're getting ratings, which is good. Everyone's rating, but I really enjoy reading what people have to say on the reviews. So, as do I. Uh, please leave a review. We might consider reading out on the show like we will for this one. Uh, Dead Ott says. I could not bring myself uh, to paint and model again. These guys have given me a great new view on the hobby and inspired me with all of their conversations, both funny and serious. I had not completed painting a full squad for nearly a year, and since watching the podcast, I've painted so many squads, individual minis, and more. Highly recommend giving them a watch or listen if you want something on when hobbying, uh, or if you are lacking passion to get back into it. I would give them more than five stars if I could. Oh, it's pretty good. Perfect, that. that. Pretty Absolutely good. perfect. Love that though. Like that's like that's such a good reaction for someone to have to the show. To have been at the point where they don't want to paint anymore, and then that's all we want to do, right? I so, genuinely hadn't considered when we started this, like pulling people out of ruts and getting them back into it. I always thought this would be yeah. our core list. Well, I mean, our core listeners do like to listen to this while they hobby. But uh, that's really quite heartwarming to hear. Yeah. Isn't I it? mean, well, that's done it. That's what's it's done it for me. Like that's what's happened to me because I was like completely out of. I hardly painted last year so I hadn't painted at all when we started doing this and then now partly because I want to paint and partly because I'm being forced to paint I've I'm now painted <laughs> topic this week me and Joe in particular have come to a bit of a realisation uh, sort of unfolded on the podcast over the last few weeks about uh, making the hobby sort of more of a relaxing enjoyable thing again um, I think there's such an obsession in this hobby with like speed and like getting stuff done and almost like minimizing the amount of time that you're doing it, which I find really, really interesting because it seems so counterintuitive to me because I've always thought the idea of a hobby was like this escapism, this thing that I can like spend loads of time on, but people are almost like trying to escape their hobby. Do you get what I mean? Um, I wanted to sort of unpack some of the projects that we've had that have maybe like we found more stressful or more relaxing and maybe talk about like the reasons why. So maybe the listeners can get more enjoyment from their hobby, find things more relaxing. Yeah. I, I Also, actually, it's been a theme of the entire podcast, I think, because I think it was like first or second episode where I was talking about struggling to, or, or like stressing a lot about painting rather than actually enjoying it. So it has been a theme uh, along the entire entire way really yeah yeah, it's come more into the conversation the last few weeks isn't it interestingly i've seen a few comments of late um from newer painters and i know that's the thing that a lot of people struggle with is like they're sort of scared to start painting because they're like worried they're going to ruin it and things like that so i feel like there's almost like this kind of like initial hump and then it levels out people go into this like speed painting route and then it almost seems to come full circle in the end i guess yeah uh james do you want to share maybe some of the projects that you've uh found stressful over the years my night army was probably my most stressful project I've ever done. I the think. night army? I thought it would have been painting in a hotel room for Golden Demon at 5 a.m., but <laughs> yeah. shows what I know. Love a bit of pressure, I do. Yeah, <laughs> especially when it comes to comms. 
Um, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I actually enjoyed that actually painting that early and getting up and doing it. Um, even though I wish I hadn't left it, left it till the very end. But anyway, uh, no, my night army was probably my, my stressful thing purely because of, um, I knew the color choices I mentioned, like always going about them looking like, uh, I've taken colors from the 1966 Le Mans golf racing team. But, um, but, uh, color choice was first, obviously the first things first, let me just explain a little bit about it. I had four weeks to paint a full night army for one of the no retreat tournaments from SN. Um, and uh, I just really struggled finding the colors to match kind of like the color scheme that I wanted and finding them, you know, that worked really well. Like a, a kind of like minty blue, kind of like teal, kind of turquoisey blue kind of color that that is, was close to like the golf racing team. It's quite hard to find. Um, and when I eventually found one, I think like a week had gone by. Um, and I was like, oh God, I've got three weeks to paint this thing. They were all built, which was fine. And the building, obviously for anyone who's done nights, you know, to leave the panels separate from the main sort of exoskeletons. But um, but a three week window to to, to paint them all was, was, was really, really uh, an Everest, which I wish I didn't have to climb. Um, looking back. It wasn't like a tiny amount of nights either six was it? It was like, yeah uh, three six. three big ones three armages or uh, moirax so the one with the uh, lightning locks because there wasn't even any armages was there it was like well they're the four drive ones they, they yeah. are but they're, they're a bit bigger, they're, they're, uh, they're bigger they've, got, they've got a bit more armor on them yeah like, yeah. yeah so yeah they're, they're trying to help you out here like, no. <laughs> take it, take it. <laughs> yeah there's a bit more to them yeah definitely um I love and, if he does, he does that entire thing, and then it like r reveals at the end that it was like a Titanicus army. It was six, <laughs> six Titanicus knights. He was yeah, like Titan stressing about Titan for Titanicus. Four weeks. Titanicus wasn't a thing back then, so <laughs> so yeah, I wish it would have been. I, I should I, have you seen that? Sorry to go on a tangent, but have you seen I think that? it. Well, I think it might have been. I don't you know? think. I don't I think, think it was. might have been. Um, have you seen that scene in in? Sorry to bring it back to the future multiple times in this episode, <laughs> but do you remember where she puts the the food in that machine in that? almost like microwave and it's a tiny little thing and it becomes a full meal. Yeah. I yeah, wish yeah. I wish I'd 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 painted Kinda. painted um Oh in Back to the Future yeah, 2. Back to the Future 2. Yeah, yeah. she's got like one. the meal, it's like a little pot. The yeah. 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 I wish I'd had I'd paint had to paint the the small ones and I could have put them in something and then blown them up. That would have been that would have been a lot easier. I think it's a pizza if I if memory serves. I think actually. it is I think a it's a pizza yeah. and it's like this it's big. A pizza, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. More of a more of a back to the future one Guy. If you if you've like if you've like watched it, you've, bit, you, you'll know what I mean or what I'm what I'm sort of like alluding to. But but um but yeah, so, you get in the eighties references by the way more than you. Know, you don't even watch films. It. What's going on? You don't even watch films. Wait, I wasn't alive in the eighties either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely feel old now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but so yeah, well, I got all the blue on, and I, and I've I mentioned it before, but I used a specific uh, specific paint which was made by a company called Mister Hobby. Mister Hobby. Hobby, OG Mr. listeners, Hobby. if you know, Mr. you know, Hobby. yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I use that Mr. Hobby blue and, uh, it obviously it's not like a normal paint. It's more like a Tamiya kind of paint. So it was very, very glossy in, in when it first went on and you can only use, I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional kind of, thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. It's bringing up nightmares. Uh, yeah. nightmares. <laughs> it was just so glossy. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Why, why Mr. Hobby? Why? <laughs> I all I had in my head as well. I don't know if you've seen it. There's like a viral video. It's actually a really sweet video, but like it's just funny as well. Where like an old guy has come out of a football game and he's like really emotional about one of the players' performances. But it's like he like nearly he's like welling up like nearly <laughs> to and trying to explain like why he was so happy to see him and he's literally just explaining like football but like crying he's like and he passed the ball and then he's like tearing up it's actually a really sweet video but that's that's just what that reminded me of so the Miss Hobby went on pretty glossy because uh, it's more it's like a Tamiya paint and I had to use a different type of thin to use it so that was kind of like it was the added pressure of using a paint that I, I hadn't really used up those types of paints before and I got a little bit of steering and a bit of advice from some friends obviously over what to do with it um which was good uh, at the time because it really helped me get the main color on. Um, but then once that color was on, obviously I'd done the normal process of glossing it, transferring it, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, then it was like trim fest. Like it was the worst experience of my life. Uh, the amount of trim on the nights, uh, I think I'd underestimated because it was the first time I'd painted like a full army of them. Um, and I Common just, L for anyone who's ever painted uh, Chaos Space Marines or yeah, Gullum. Yeah. Or yeah 
um i was like oh it's just it's just you know it's just black it'll be fine and i was using vallejo 950 um which uh, covers like tarmac as you know so it went over quite well but um but tell you what did. you could have used a bit of cling film I, yeah a bit of cling film could have airbrushed all the trim Put the cling film in the panels. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think of that hack at the time, so unfortunately that was not used. Um, but I literally spent, I think at one point, I spent probably about a week, a week and a half, just painting trim. I painted like black for a week and a half, and I, the date was getting closer and closer and closer and closer, and I was just like, there's just, it's just, it's just never ending. Um, and the thing for me with the trim as well is that like I didn't want to skimp out because I didn't want to go. You got the the flat part there like that, and then you've got the little lip mm-hmm. before the panel. And I was like, no, I'm going to paint all the lips as well because I just want to. I, I just personally hate it when you see that you painted the the trim, but you've left that little. And flat people lip. try and people try and disguise that sometimes by just doing like quite a thick recess. shading. Yeah, Shade. yeah. And it's like no, you can tell. And I, I can see. I, I was just like, it. I, it was really bugging me. I was just like, I can't do that because the thing is, the contrast between the black and the Miss Toby blue was so stark. I was like. If I leave it, it's just going to be so obvious. Um, so yeah, I literally spent like a week and a half just doing trim, and it was it was absolutely. I've got to say, it was absolutely soul destroying. But when I got to the end of it, they were literally at the point where they had transfers on fully. Uh, all the trim work had been done, and then all the metals had been done, and uh, it was literally a case of just highlighting stuff um, and doing weathering and battle damage because I was going for more of a, like a, a bit of a realistic kind of like scale modeled kind of approach to doing them rather than like an heavy metal box art style. Um, and that, that was a combination of doing a project in a very limited space of time with products that I'd never used before, uh, doing a stylistic execution that was outside my comfort zone and normality as well. So it really, within the last couple of days, I only had like literally three, four days before I was getting on the plane to fly. I think they were still drying when I was going down the runway, to be fair. Like, um, you know. So was that like, in terms of that stressing you out, that yeah. painting time, was that was you not enjoying painting those at all? When I was doing the trim, I wasn't, no. I was like, I I obviously got other armies and stuff, and I was I would said that I was taking that army, so I was kind of like committed and stuck to it. And like, you know, uh like Pilo and the guys there said, Don't really want you changing your army last minute for obvious reasons. So like, they advertise it. They they advertise the parents, yeah. Is that yeah. though because of the time thing? Like, do you think if you'd had longer to do that project, it would have been stressful still? Um Maybe. Well, not necessarily stressful, but like we talk about in the sense of like relaxing and enjoyable. But did you find just the task too monotonous that it was like soul destroying, or was it was like it if, in combination? If you, had, if you had four months to do that same thing, oh, I would have enjoyed it, it more. Yeah, you would have yeah. enjoyed no, it. I would have enjoyed it more. Yeah, definitely. and well, it's funny because like the time the time frame was self imposed, wasn't it? Yeah, like you kind of <laughs> yeah, you I, knew you had it, but coming up for ages. Yeah. And I think you just were putting it off. Putting is this that off, thing yeah. where you're like, you do your homework the night before school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. But I, but I personally, for me, I, I don't a know. A thousand what, words left on my dissertation for tomorrow morning, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's what is. Uh, I, I, I just personally find that I paint better under a bit of pressure. Is that true though? I genuinely feel that like I paint better when I, I'm under pressure. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true. I think maybe... I think maybe you tell yourself that because you want to feel it gives you a little bit more comfort in painting under pressure. Does that make sense? So it's when you are painting under pressure, you're like saying to yourself, "Oh, it's okay." Do, do you know what this it is? is where I do my best work. Do, do you know what it is? I, I I think this is the best way to me to explain it. Like when I have more time to paint something, because of all the things that I think about when it comes to painting, as in like the narrative or like what color choice is, or like you know how am I going to approach it or whatever. I will instinctively have like a gut feeling over what I want to do. And normally for me and what I want to execute, that's normally the right thing. But what happens is when I'm relaxed and I do it, I I, I have the gut feeling, which I think 90% of the time is the thing I should do. And what happens is I just start going off on another course and thinking of other things. It, and, and and really... But if that's what you enjoy doing... Yeah, no, I know then... it, is, it is. But like, especially but that project wasn't an experiment. It was very much like... I need to get it I done. I need to get this, this done. Is, yeah. This is the process. This is the colors. This is the way I'm doing it. This is this. So like, I didn't want to go off on that train of thought, I think, for the project. And I think the problem with that is is the reason why I find comfort under pressure, combining with the fact that I find, personally for me, I feel that I push myself harder and progress better as a painter through being under pressure. Um, I just felt that by, being, by f- forcing myself to have to do it within that time frame, I knew that, I couldn't go any down any of those avenues and I just have to be stick to stick to the thing that I 
that I had, I thought I wanted to do and use those natural gut instincts of, oh, well, the, uh, the model's this color. I'm going to do this color for lenses because of this. And rather than going, oh, actually, would green be better? Or would, would red be better? Or actually, maybe if I use yellow, oh, I'm just going to try these yellows out. And then I'm hemorrhaging like 30 minutes trying those yellows out and then going, oh, actually, that's not right. And that's 30 minutes that I could have been doing the trim or, like, you know, so like, I think that's the reason why. And I think like, same with like Dante, like when I was painting for GD, like, Obviously, I love the model and folk character, like blah, 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 blah. But like, I, I I know that if I had more time on it, I'd probably spend way more time just thinking about, oh, it's my favorite model. Should I use this, 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 this? this? Like, and I'm, whereas I'm like, no, this, these are colors that I've done with gold before. I know I can add this to it or I can do this or this color works better with it. And I, I just felt that those natural gut instincts, I didn't have the time to go off on those weird pilgrimages of experimentation you know and i think that's yeah. that's the thing that i think for me i think that being under that pressure and having those deadlines and time frames i think that helps me massively i think that sounds to me more like a motivation thing and that because you've got to do it on a deadline it forces you to make less choices to be more streamlined rather than it being a relaxation thing or like a stress relief does that make sense yeah yeah uh, do you know just, yeah, yeah i think also as well though when when I put done that last brush stroke or that last thing on them and they were done and I had like probably got a couple of hours to spare on the night before or whatever because I actually remember I finished painting and then just packed my packed my suitcase to fly like it it felt really good to have achieved a thing and go uh, you know what at the start I just didn't know if I was going to be able to get it done in time but at the end of it I I, I beat it does that make sense and yeah. I, that, that that for me felt good I don't know um I guess you wouldn't have had that same sense of accomplishment because you wouldn't have overcome the hardship if that had taken you like three months. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, more. Yeah. And then, then you're talking about feeling after the fact. Though we're obviously talking about feeling relaxed, enjoying your time while painting. So mm. obviously that was quite a stressful one to deal with. It was. It was pretty. Yeah, I, for me it was. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do it again. Let's put it this way: I haven't painted another night with that army in a long time. <laughs> so, just a quick one: we wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you're on a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at SiegeStudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get five percent of your first commission using the code PAINT5. Back to the show. I don't really, I know we had to pick one project to give as examples and I quite, kind of struggled to pick like one for the stressful column because I think it's over the years, as I kind of alluded to earlier, it's like an issue that I've just found with painting in general. Mm. Like, I don't know what it is. It's like pressures I put on myself or I've spoke before about feeling the pressures of working here and not being a professional painter. So like being at a certain level when I joined instantly, the next time I went to paint, I was like, Oh God, like I need to be all of a sudden that pressure was on that I was adding to myself. No, one, James wasn't sitting there going like, with the whip you've got the job yeah. but you need to be a better painter. We spoke about that a little bit on one of the first episodes. It was like that imposter syndrome thing of like, you've walked in the door and you're instantly surrounded by people that are like, so much further along than you yeah. and you're like comparing yourself to them which is so unfair on yourself but you can't really help doing yeah. it I think because I've done that instantly I've worked here for five years now nearly five years so because I've done that instantly like the last five years of painting for me has been a lot of like putting unnecessary pressure on myself it's been like completely like looking back now I feel like I'm coming out the other end of it now and actually managing to enjoy painting again but it's been very, I would say, like detrimental to my progress as a painter over the five years because I've ended up not painting that much, not enjoying painting that much because there's just so much pressure all the time. It's like the opposite to what James is saying, really, where like I don't feel like I've benefited from putting myself under pressure. Um, different type of pressure, though, I suppose, because I'm not putting myself under these like strict deadlines or anything. It's more just like pressure on how good something has to be. So it's like I never I wasn't giving myself enough time to actually get that good. I was like, I don't know. Anyway, so it's kind of hard to pick a specific project because I haven't done that many in comparison to you two. And most of them have been stressful. <laughs> like um, I think what I've, and the, the most notable ones I've kind of spoken about already, like the Necrons thing, the failed Necrons army, like, to get stressed enough at it that I just didn't want to do it anymore after doing like the hard bit 
or like the bit that shouldn't be that fun. Like I was ready to do the fun bit, the painting. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to hear then, might be getting a bit ahead of ourselves with the topic, but since you've had that sort of like revelation in the same sense that I have in the last few weeks um, from having these conversations, have the projects you've been painting since then been more relaxing? And what, what do you think the difference is now? Is it just a mindset switch or? Um, so yeah, it's a couple of things. Like I think I'm letting myself um, not paint if I don't feel like painting. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, uh, before it would be like, well, I've got to get some, I want to get better. So I've got to get some painting in tonight. And it's like, if I'd rather be doing something else and this is supposed to be a hobby that's fun, then what's the, what's the point? Do you just know work I mean? then. Yeah. yeah. And then it's just also just like putting me in an, in a negative space when painting. So then I'm not going to enjoy the next time or I'm not going to want to paint because it's not been a nice time. And I think I gave myself a bit of a break. Obviously do, doing this podcast has helped like loads because it's just like, I think it gives me like some new things to think about, obviously, but then also it gives me a little bit more like accountability. Like, you know, we have to talk about certain things or now we're doing these like monthly like the built annuaries and stuff like that. So it's like, it gives me like a little bit extra um, accountability in that sense. And then that has kind of added on to, okay, I, I gave myself a little bit of a break, gave myself like a bit of a fresh start almost. And then by the time the next time I was painting, um, I just, I didn't even put like a time frame on like, okay, I'm going to give myself a week break and then next week I'm going to paint or whatever. I was just like, next time I get an urge to paint, I'm going to paint. And I think that put me in a positive place when painting then. So I was like randomly, like one day I was like, oh, I really feel like painting tonight. So I'm going to go and paint. And then I was like aware of the fact that I was going to stop if it, if I wasn't enjoying it. You know what I mean? Like I, I was focusing more on that, I suppose. Um, and then, so I enjoyed that session and then I've been more conscious of like, okay, just, it sounds so simple, but like just painting when I feel like actually painting, mm -hmm. stop pushing myself into like, or feeling guilty for doing something else that I want to do when I should be painting because I want to get better at painting, like that kind of thing. So that it, it's a bit of a mindset shift and just also just being a bit easier on myself, I suppose. Yeah. I think that's something that we've had like listener comments before. People say like, oh, I don't really feel like painting. Like it's been a while, whatever. What should I do? And like our answer has always just been like, just just don't paint then because if you're just yeah. going in with like this negative mindset to start with you're not going to do your best work you're not going to enjoy it and i don't necessarily think for some people maybe but i don't necessarily think that just forcing yourself to do it is going to make you feel more motivated either um i think like being content with just like not having a definitive date on when you're going to pick the brushes back up do you know what i mean yeah like how many people take like literally like years off of this and then go back to it like your models are still there do you know what i mean yeah i think also once i like I, again, it's what it's deciding what you want to get out of it. Like I understand why, like with James or yourself, like um, entering competitions and things and wanting to progress actively at a high level. I understand why you then have to put yourself into okay. Well, I do need to paint even though I don't want to do tonight. Tonight, or or if you're doing it as a job, I do need to paint even though if I don't, I don't want to. Yeah. But if if I don't have that like drop that that goal mm. then i don't know why i was putting that pressure on myself i was like putting the same pressure on myself as you two without having the actual goal of winning a competition or particularly getting better or do you know what i mean like yeah it's really weird that, that, that's what i'm saying like i only put myself under that pressure for an objective or for a task if that makes sense yeah yeah like uh, you know we're going to talk about other things obviously in, in, in this part of the episode but like when those things aren't there, like that's when you can relax, if that makes sense. I think that's yeah. one of the ways. That's what I mean. And it's like, those things aren't there for me. Cause I don't, it's not a goal of mine necessarily. Like it, it's one of those things where it's like, it would be nice, but I also understand the work that has to go into that. And that's not really something I want to push for. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know why I was putting myself under that pressure for so long. Um, I suppose as well, you've got a bit of a compounding negative because there's no like, positive reinforcement at the end of it even if you do it if you get what I mean because you're not 
you, there's no competition at the end of it. If you're not gaming, there's no game at the end of it. There's no yeah. like finished army, especially if you're just playing like single models just for the sake of improving. And you're never going to improve. If, if you're looking to improve, you're never going to look at it and be like, I've improved, done. Yeah, like, exactly. It's, just this, always it's always this moving goalpost. You're just kicking this can like further and further down the road. You're never exactly. going to be completely satisfied with it. Yeah. So then having that like light bulb moment of like, oh, okay, I should just paint like when I'm, when I'm going to enjoy my time painting. So like picking a, a model that like, like we're doing the build January thing. Like as soon as those warlocks got released, I've never had an interest in Eldar before, but I love that model. And mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, I'd love to paint that one day. Mm -hmm. So like picking that model and just having fun while I'm painting is like, let's change that really for me. So yeah, this, the picking a project that was particularly stressful is quite difficult for me. Cause it's like most of them, do you yeah. know what I mean? And, and there's not that many of them. I guess um, for you, it's not a project then it's a, like a time stamp yeah. on your sort of painting journey if you will yeah and then like as I say uh, s sort of shifted throughout the the time of this podcast really since like when did we start it like midway last year yeah somewhere like May yeah. something um, took a while like but um, and obviously like summer summer's just like really busy anyway with other stuff but yeah took, took a while but like um starting to kind of enjoy it again yeah really. i think i think just reevaluating the pressure that you're putting on yourself is a good way to put it overall um yeah yeah i guess i'll go then similar to you i don't have i've had a few projects that i found like stressful for a myriad of reasons but i don't think it's necessarily like one project it's like something that they all had in common and it is that time thing which is why it fascinates me so much why people are so obsessed with speed because I find that similar to James's story I suppose the less time I have to do something the more on edge I feel throughout the process and I'll always be dissatisfied with the amount that I've gotten done in that time frame like regardless if you get what I mean so if there's been like a big commission that I'm working on even though I love the painting bit and it's not the actual like physically sitting there painting that it's, it's not that I don't find that relaxing is that how can I find this thing I love relaxing when I've got that in the back of my head that like I need to get a certain amount done by X day or X time. Or even if like the, the deadline isn't for like, say like three months, but in the morning or when I sat down to paint at the start of my day, I went, oh, by the end of the day, I want to get this done. Then when it gets to like 3 p.m., I'm thinking like, oh, I'm not actually like as close to my goal as I was expecting, if you get what I mean. So that's why I say like the, the speed painting thing fascinates me because the thing that I've always loved about this hobby is actually sitting down and painting, like the actual doing of it. Mm -hmm. Like I love that. And I think for a little while, I was getting a bit too retrospectively happy. I wasn't enjoying it in the moment. And I was looking back on it and being like, oh, I really enjoyed painting that. It's like, yeah, but you didn't. You enjoyed the actual doing it bit, but I wasn't in a happy place when I was doing it, if that makes sense. Mm. That's why I'll you enjoy that you did it, but like not while you were doing it. Not even that. I, I enjoy the physical doing of it, but it's like, it's like I said, it's that weird thing of like in the back of your head. It's like it, it, um, there's so much going on, like in terms of pressure and stress that is often like self-induced or because of time or whatever. But it's like, I actually enjoy the doing it bit, but I can't settle if you get what I mean. But that's, mm. that's why I think breaking it down and setting yourself much smaller, tiny little flag ticking moments or flag picking up moments, I think is the best way to tackle that. And I think that's always been the best way to tackle it, especially for whether you're doing something for a commission or whether you're doing something for a personal army or whether you're working some stupid deadline you've self-imposed on yourself or whatever, I think breaking it down, it gives you that, that, that feel. If I could have had the feeling that I had when I'd done the last brush stroke on the night, every night in the lead up to that, by going, I'm going to get this done by the end of this day, I think I wouldn't have been as stressed and I would have enjoyed the process and the project and still hit the dead yeah. time frame. I, th I genuinely think that's the way to do it. It's like, it is by setting those little in, you, it's not like a dopamine hit, but it's like, it's that little, no, bit, it's, it's, it's a little it's, bit of reinforcement. Yeah, yeah. It was spoke about it before. It's easy yeah. wins. Yeah. I think, nice. I think that if I, if, if I'd have thought about it in that way and gone, right tonight, I just want to get the Mr. Hobby on everything. And I would have been like, <laughs> it's done tonight. I just want to get all the pauldrons trims done you know if i'd have done stuff like that rather than going i've got all these armor panels and all this trim and all this like it, that 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 angst and that kind of like annoyance or not annoyance but that kind of like stress is it just builds like this big gray cloud around you do you know what i mean like and i think yeah, yeah i think in like a more grandiose sense like especially when i'm talking about like my personal hobby it has just been that realization switch of like to actually stop and 
smell the roses, like cliche thing. Like actually, while I'm painting, rather than like I said, because it's uh, it's it, it's always in this hobby. Like the obsession is speed. I don't know if that's just like my little social bubble, but it just seems everyone's obsessed with speed painting. Get your army done fast. I mean, we've done topics on it, and I totally understand why people like to do that. But I find it really interesting because, like I said at the start of this episode. I always thought a hobby was supposed to be this like distraction, this thing you get to do, not this thing you have to do to get to another goal. The speed thing comes from getting something ready to play a game. Mm. And that's the people where the game in is their true yeah, hobby. Yeah, true. Enjoyment. But I think where I've never played the games, I've still picked up on that and yeah. sort of brought it into my own bubble because you hear other people talking about it. You feel like you're kind of supposed to be doing it. That's really mm. interesting because like, it's like speed from speed is being this thing because of different things. You've said it about your the thing you just said. You've said it about the fact that it's for gaming on my part the speed isn't because of any of those things my, the speed on my part is because obviously I do this here in the office and studio every day and then I go home and I've only got X amount of hours at home so yeah. my, my speed is because of because I know I've only got two hours to get, of time. get this much done I had this conversation um, with Josh my PT the other day who mm. I bring up all the time he might as well be a co-host <laughs> at this point um, but I was explaining to him how like at the moment, trying to manage my time between like, this actually ties in perfectly with, with the, the painting for enjoyment thing because the things that I was talking about where like with painting with you two where you have these goals and these specific things so you're pushing through because you want to reach these goals rather than just looking at it as a hobby that you enjoy. I have um, like, fitness with like powerlifting and stuff that I, that's something where I do have a lot of goals and I do want to compete and I do want to push for a lot of that. So I'm spending a lot of brain power on that every week. On top of that, I have like other things that are considered hobbies that I have goals at within like for myself that I want to progress with like photography and music and painting. So I have these four things that are like hobbies mm -hmm. that you're supposed to enjoy. Um, but three of them, I have like these lofty goals where I'm having to push through and spend time on. There's only so much time in a week. So actually painting is the one that should be the strictly just enjoyment one because I don't have the, those like lofty goals kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think potentially shifting that sort of focus over to those other things has also helped me appreciate the time I have to paint and appreciate it for something that's enjoyment, enjoyment if that yeah. makes sense yeah um, one thing i just want to call back to is what i'm interested in is you said the reason you found it was because you've got a limited time to paint in the evenings or whatever and you said oh, i've got I only got so much time to get this done but you haven't got a goal at the end of it so what is even though you might only have two hours to paint in the evening why do you need to get it done by like x date if well, you're not playing a game this, for this, example this, this, i suppose the idea is yeah you're saying like why don't you give yourself six months to paint a character then because You'll, you'll have those little bits of time every evening and you'll have a character at the end of your six months and you would have enjoyed all that time. Right? Which comes back to the time thing. So it's like you're in a rush still to get it done, even though you've you don't got, have the goal you of haven't the got tournament. A deadline. Or... Yeah, I know because, uh, and that's the hybrid of wanting to get it done and having a limited time in my mind. But at the same time, I think that if I'm not thinking of it in that mindset, I won't be pushing myself. I think that when I take, if I take my foot off the, the gas, the limited time is. This is what you were saying earlier. Yeah. To be fair, the limited time frame is the thing that you thinks drives. Okay, it sure. To be a yeah. I, I I find that I work best when it's maximum risk, maximum pressure, as in for like pushing myself, because I know like let's as a good example, let's just say right, okay, there's a a pull stroke edge highlight on this piece of detail. I don't. I need know that I need to execute that perfect first time. Okay. So that mindset of that's how I've, what I have to do, I believe that the thinking of that makes me do it first time better because I know that I only have that time and that finite one hit, one shot to do it. I, I just find it pushes me more. Like as a good example, last night I, I had a banner that I had to paint, okay? Um, and let's just say let's just say that I, I go to myself, right, um, I need X amount of time to get it done because it's at this point and I know I've, only, I've got to do these bits and bobs on it to finish it off. I know I've got this much time. I have to do it within that time frame, and it has to be to this standard or this quality or whatever. Like the the culmination of all those things means that I have to do it, and it makes me perform better doing it in my mind. That's the way that I look at it personally. But yeah, what are some examples then of some projects that you've done that you found like 
super relaxing like compared to that night project then uh dark strider town model that i've done i absolutely love that what do you think the reason was that you enjoyed that it's not, blood, it's not a blood angel i'm using retro so you don't enjoy painting blood angels i love enjoy it heard I love, it first you heard <laughs> it first in the episode i absolutely love and I massively enjoy painting blood angels but the reason why the reason why it's a different thing it's a diff, it's a different love i'll explain that because my mindset and approach when it comes to painting a blood angel is very was so other world compared to the the dark strider model because again going to the other thing i said when i paint a blood angel i'm thinking so what 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 i say okay he's in the third company what squad is he in what's the sergeant's name in that squad what color what 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 markings has he got in his armor has he got any has he got any honor, honors on his on his bolt gun or on his on his swords has he got any kill marks on this has he got what what's his story what's his background how can i portray that on the model what what details gonna put oh he killed a lot of orcs so, i'm gonna put an orc skull on the base so, for that one like so that's kind of like that's kind of like the thought process when when it when the the moment i start so when i when i I've been starting this Primaris Blood Angels army that I've told you about. The Death Company squad, just to build it, just to build it and put all the little things on there that I want to give each single one of them the, the individual character and where where that that brother has come from. He's been from this squad and he fought in this campaign. He's got this on him to show that he's done that, blah, blah. That's before we even paint. Yeah. Right? So with this, with Dark Strider, it was very much like, it was very much like, cool, okay. Um, I'm going to paint Dark Strider. I've not really painted town models before. I want to paint it in a really cool color scheme that I've never seen a town model painted in before. Cool. Okay. What old paints are like? Oh, leash purple. Oh, I'm going to paint the leash purple towel. Okay, cool. Oh, that purple works really well with the skin. That's great. Do you see what I mean though? It's yeah, this like, like, the commonality here is this like low stakes, just mellow. I'm just it's, it's funny. So yeah, like the, you get more enjoyment. You enjoy your time more when you're painting the things that you don't care about as much because you see it as more freedom and less pressure. Yeah, but you, this is where it gets a bit, not odd, but strange, but I suppose it is all strange, but this is where it gets all strange. If because, we're, we're talking strictly enjoyment. Yeah, no, yeah. I so, enjoy so it. Like, I, I tell you, so I, like, I, I love that model, every single brushstroke, every single decision. Yeah, every so it's, it's like, interesting uh, that you, you've kind of put yourself, not that you have a choice, but you've put yourself in this horrible position where... In order to progress, yeah. you feel like you need to be under a high amount of pressure yeah, yeah. and yeah. self-impose a lot of these rules. But in order to enjoy, you need to be don't give, don't absolutely give no stress, no no rules, yeah. complete freedom, no real care about the model other than think it looks I, cool and do, having a do, bit of Do you know what? Actually, I, I do resonate with this. I still, yeah, well, that's yeah. it. Though, that's yeah. still, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. I still, yeah. like... Even though I'm like in this zone of like, oh, I don't care. Like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to experiment with it. I'm going to try some cool things. I'm going to do something a bit different, blah, blah, blah. Like, even though all of that is bubbling away, underneath that as the layer or the foundation, it's still, it's going to be super sharp, super neat, clean. I can't make mistakes. Yeah, because that's just that, your standard. That's just your your one gear. Yeah, no, you no, know? Yeah. So, But it's interesting. So perhaps the key to doing both is having one of each of those projects on at once and then whatever you're in tune with when you sit down at your desk that uh, evening you know, I, is the one that you I have this like for. little pit of not competition models but I would say like competition style models so like single figure on a plinth fancy base and they are all in a state of barely painted like just waiting for an intermission where yep. I need a break from something yep. and I'll pick and I don't even actually intend on finishing any of those ever. They kind of just the exist. Just, they're like yeah. my little playground. They're like a little sandbox where I just get to mm. almost almost give myself the feeling that I'm working on a competition piece because that's where I get the enjoyment. Yeah. And I can take ages on this because that's what you do for a competition piece. Yeah. But no stakes because I know I'm not actually going to enter it. It just exists. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I was just saying like, so so I've got exactly the same as you. I've got a Kelomorph. I love the Kelomorph model. It's like one of my favorite non-space marine like xenos models i love the kelomorph it's such a great model made a really cool base for it i've thought about how the, there's a broken screen like on the base like one of the like pad things on the base there's gonna be a lighting effect up on him blah blah i'm gonna set in a bit of a darker kind of thought of all these things blah blah blah, blah. have i put a single brush stroke on it yet no <laughs> like you know like I, I, yeah but it's I, there yeah, i know it's there but waiting like, for when when you want but to this is the thing so with with like uh, Dark Strider I was like cool yeah okay I've got the colours I'm using I'm going to go for Trider blue, blue, purple and orange okay that's going to look great they all work with each other really well cool I know I'm doing this doing this doing this in, in, and, and, and I'll just say and, and that model progressed 
so much quicker. And I just got loads done on it really quickly because I just wasn't, I was being neat and careful, but I just didn't care. I was just like, I'm just like, yeah. oh, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. I'll do that. Maybe like, that's the key then, the multiple multiple projects yeah Cir circling in it kind of works with what you've just said like one of my examples was going to be of the most enjoyable projects i've had was i painted that single dark angel model a couple of months ago and that was not even like meant to be finished i just got carried away with it because i was enjoying it so much like you said i had that model was just like like i said in my little sandbox of like, i'm just gonna paint this when i'm like in between projects or whatever or I don't really feel like painting more red this evening. I want to paint a different color, like just to give myself a bit of a mental break. But I was enjoying it so much. And I, it was one of those things where like, you literally lose track of time. Like I sit down, and I'm going to paint for a couple of hours. Like six hours goes by, I don't even notice. Yeah. And like the model's like nearly finished. And I finished it off. So I guess maybe yeah. maybe that could be a takeaway for this. Like, yeah. Give think, yourself a little zero stakes project, just a little palette cleanser. I think the thing, the thing for me is the emotive love for X faction or X model or the level of depth I want to put into it is actually the thing that makes me stagnate a little bit. I was about to say it's interesting because that's the th one of the things I've spoke about this briefly before when it comes to Warhammer lore and stuff like that. It's one of the things I've always almost been jealous that I don't have. I don't have this undying affinity to one of the armies or one of the stories or or anything I don't I have, totally feel that as well I don't yeah. have that and I've always been really jealous of like um, how Ad is with Ultramarines or how you are with Blood Angels because if, if I'm yeah I could put on a bit of a front and say that I'm like that with Dark Angels but I'm not I just think they're cool when they happen to be the first chapter that I thought was cool when I was a kid when I saw them in a book um, so I've always been quite jealous I don't have that but it actually sounds like it's also a bit of a pain <laughs> to have that yeah. because, I, because the pressure is, I, I can understand that. If I was so like, I'm trying to think like, it, it's weird. it's almost like if I could translate it to music, it's like if I was doing a cover of a song that I was like exactly. completely exactly. in love with, it would be, if I was doing a cover of one of my favorite songs of all time, it, I, I would be so, so under pressure. It probably would push me to be as best as possible. And I also probably wouldn't necessarily enjoy that process until it was done. So yeah, I, I've always been jealous of that, but maybe it's a bit of a benefit to not as well. So I think that's the reason why it was a bit of a running joke. Like every year for no retreat, when I went, I was like, oh, are you going to bring the Blood Angels? Yeah, 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 I'll bring them. And then like, I'd take something else. And, like, and I think I've, I think this conversation has finally hit the nail on the head and made me realize why I never got my, my, never, my firstborn army has never been 100% finished. And I think that's because I was getting better. I was obviously practicing and getting better and better as a painter. And because they're my favorite army, I'm like, I want the best version of that army that I can. And obviously as I was painting models within it, I was I had the same mindset of pushing myself and trying to improve and better, 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 better. And what was happening is the army would 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 be completely, maybe not in colors and tones because I was using the same sort of palette and whatever, but, but the quality of level would vary massively from older to newer models. And I think that's the thing. That's the reason why. So like, that's exactly why I fell out of love with my sons of Horus army and why it's been shelved. Yeah. And like Joe will laugh at me for this, yours but like is, yours is between five models. <laughs> <laughs> that's the funniest bit. But also like, because that's been up over such a long period of time. Yeah. yeah. Such oh, a I don't get it. Project. It makes perfect sense. It's just funny on paper, isn't it? Yeah. But equally like almost, I couldn't match it if I wanted to. Like I was painting like this fifth model just to get it finished. And even now I look at it and I can tell I was trying to paint it, not how I would paint it. Like I had the original next to it and I was like, I'm going to copy this. Forget how you like to paint it. Copy but, but this. I think that and I still couldn't do it. I could still tell. Yeah. That's probably because you painted them individually as well, to be fair. If you'd done it as a unit, you probably would have been obviously the No, because like even like just the, the sharpness of like the highlights. Yeah. Like it, yeah. It's crazy how much you progress. And like, if you're, I'm thinking of it in the sense of like an army, like you're doing, if you've got like 150 models done, your 151st is going to be better than the first. You know what I mean? Like there's no way around that. I think uh, it's, it's a real difficult one. And that, uh, that's the thing. So I, I think, again, this is the thing I, I want to, I, I want to approach both the Maudians and Blood Angels in a very individual unit basis, but stick, use the precursor for the next one as a reference every single time. I think that's the best way to approach it so that you are getting that uniformity between, between it as well. Um, I don't, I, the one thing I don't want to, and this is the thing I'd always advocate to anybody who's watching this, like I, I don't want to dilute my emotive love or passion for that faction. I think that's the one thing you shouldn't because I think that adds so much of a richness to the models and to, the, to what you paint. Um, but yeah, trying to find that happy medium balance of, is it going to 
tick that box for, for me as like the thing that I love, you know, and also am I actually going to get it all done sometime this decade? <laughs> you know, so, so yeah. yeah. It's an in- interesting thing to think about, isn't it? Yeah. If you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at Siege, head over to our Patreon. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a catalogue of over 250 PDF and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your paintings to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash Siege Studios. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments below on YouTube. Or if you're listening on any of the audio platforms, please fire us a DM at Siege Studios on Instagram. This question, Wet Palette says, how high should your painting lamp be? I've heard the higher, the better. Amen. 100%. Amen. Well, I mean, there's got to be a limit, right? I'm not saying well, attach I'm it to the I'm going to come ceiling. out of the gate and just immediately disagree with that. Right. Like, Okay, this is going to be base rim, spray cam, 3.0. Um, sharp Don't forget the sharp and dull knife. Sharp yeah, blade, sharp and dull knife. I'm going to shoot from the hip straight away. Um, first things first, light height totally depends on, number one, your actual height as well. That's actually something to take into consideration. And I really want to explain why. I love the idea. You, if you're like, you should. If you're like tiny and you're being told to put your, <laughs> yeah. your light like all the yeah. way over. So, so you, you want to go for like a nine foot minimum, regardless <laughs> yeah, of yeah. your table. Yeah. <laughs> first things first, Let's just segue slightly really quickly into lights. You should be using, in all honesty, you should be using a bar light, um, a daylight bar light that's at least between 50, 60 centimetres wide, uh, just so that way uh, you can have it directly above you. Um, and I see this, and I've got to say this, I see this on all the classes that we teach. We just, I just had a t- class that I taught at Bad Moon this weekend just gone, and there were loads of people there on the class, you know, not pulling out any specific student, but there were loads of students there that their posture while sitting and painting was not the best. Okay. And I, and I've got to say this, like in the moment in painting, you won't feel it obviously, you know, but for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and months and years of painting, it catches up with you. So posture is posture is really important. And one of the ways to make sure that you're, you are in the best posture is to have your light above you high enough that you can sit with a straight back chest or stomach touching your desk or close to the desk. Sitting close to the desk, your posture wise, it allows you to put your forearms, elbows, and brace in two positions. You both brace with your hands and also your forearms on the desk. And being straight back, it just means it's naturally more comfortable anyway. If I could have a standing painting desk at home, I would. I genuinely would. It wouldn't be very deep, but I would have I would have a decent standing painting desk. To, to, I can't have that. So to the best thing I can do is have a very comfortable chair, a high light above me. And when I say high light, it's probably just at the same height as the top of my head. Um, but that's obviously depending on, on, on your height. Again, I'm five, eight, so I'm not the tallest. I'm like, you know, but if you're six foot, whatever, you can lower the chair, whatever you need to do to make sure that you are straight and the light is above you shining down you, it, it is directly, directly linked to posture. And you will sit there with a bad back. If you have a low light, half the reason why a lot of students on classes, when I see them that lean over the desk and have bad posture while painting, et cetera, is because they're using a smaller light. Okay, a tiny light that's not an arm bar, that's not above them. And they're actually bending over, not because it's more comfortable, not because of anything else, purely because the light, the light being low is forcing them to get under it and be under it. So they're leaning forward to lay under it. If you've got a, a if you haven't got a bar light and you want to fix immediately fix that, all you need to do is get a box or something, put it on your desk, or have something really tall to place that smaller lower light above you, and it will instantly fix the problem. Um, but yeah. Your, your your lamp or your light should be above you. Obviously, your height is take to, you have to take your height into consideration when doing it. And that's that. I'm going to tag a little caveat on the back of that. Yeah. In terms of height, I would, the reason I don't like to go higher the better is because you don't want a scenario where you're casting shadows and you've got downlight. No, on the model. no, you're correct. Because when you're painting, you'll tend to point the model sort of at your eyes. So the model isn't like sat perfectly horizontal. It's not sat perfectly vertical. It's sat somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. I try to have it so that the light is perfectly sort of perpendicular to the model. So it's it's firing at it yeah, rather yeah. than firing down and above it or from behind it causing no. like shadow. Yeah. Because sometimes you'll have a scenario where like there's artificial shadows going on or it's just hard to see details. Yeah. The way I like to treat it is like I want whatever scenario I'm in, however you want to sit and place the light around you, 
I want it to be a, the light to be coming from like as close to and as from the same direction as my eyes mm. and how I'm looking at the model. That's generally yeah. my go-to. When, when I was saying as high as possible, I don't mean like bolting into the ceiling or something stupid like that. I mean, I mean, I literally mean just higher than you so that you can get under it. Yeah, because it's the getting under it that stops you from having curvature of the spine. Yeah, I, I usually go for like just sort of above my forehead. Yeah, sort of a yeah. Situation. I think the the lower end of the chair is handy if you're taller. That's definitely something I yeah struggled with. Um, one thing I heard about is a lot of people use those, you know, those um, sit stand desks that have like the height adjust. Yeah. Still using that to sit down, but just raising the height slightly just so mm. it brings your elbows up. I certainly uh, yeah. like to be an yeah. alternative for that as well if you're, yeah. a, if you're a taller lad. Yeah. And yeah. I will say this that I'm going to chuck a plug in there because I, I, I am quite passionate about comfortability while painting because I see it all the time on classes. Like the reason why, as a business, we do sell lights on our store and our website, and it is a bit of a plug because I genuinely want people to be more comfortable while they're painting. We do, we do work with a company called Native Lighting that do make uh, some really good uh, daylight lamps. We do stock one of them that I actually worked with that, uh, Native on to create, which is the Onyx. Um, and it is on the store if you are interested in purchasing one. Um, and it, yeah. it, it's a game changer for people who have been using smaller lights. I was going to say as well, it's not like we sell a load of lights. Like we sell that one because yeah. we think that one is the best one to use. Yeah. yeah. Um, I use I use one of the Onyx lamps. I didn't even know that you guys designed it. I bought one like from the store, like around the time <laughs> that I started the company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how does it feel to be sat with the the co designer? <laughs> um, I have a I have a little attached. I know it's a long episode. I have a little side question uh -huh. to add on to that. Do you or do you always have the room light on as well? Yeah. No. Yeah. Because I recently didn't for the just I'd always just had the room light on as well mm -hmm. um I'd like I sit like I have a window next to me so if it's like during the day and I was painting at the weekend obviously I don't need the light on so I just had the light yeah, yeah. as it got darker while I was painting obviously I was now just sat there with just with my light on and for whatever reason I just found it way easier to focus on I do that. my painting mm -hmm. like to have the room dark but then just my light on the model it was like I found it really, I found it way easier. It's to like the rest. The it's like the rest of the room is sort of switched off, and you can just concentrate. Yeah, focus like, on your um, little space. It's like I feel like the rest of the light, just coming from your your room light, is obviously like flooding the space as well. Here's the difference: it's if the color temperature of the light matches. So if the ceiling lights yeah, in your room, yeah, mine don't. Mine definitely. Yeah, don't, so if right. the ceiling lights in your room are very warm, yeah, white yeah. as they often tend to be. And you've got like a daylight balanced lamp. That's exactly why. Then yeah. you've got like this color clash going on. Yeah, yeah. and that I'd, I'd never realized until it happened. And then I was like, I've never had anyone talk about that. Um, so that's why I advise always get if you've got like spotlights, just change them for daylight, daylight LEDs, and you'll you'll you can use you can use. I, I've painted when my I've painted with my uh, daylight bulbs in the ceiling in my room before without needing my lamp because it's just it gives you a bit softer ambient lighting. But um, but yeah, if you colour match it, it's brilliant. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to be switching the light off more. I'll just turn mine off, being honest. Yeah. 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 Uh, hobby hack. This is our little closing segment where we like to share a little hobby hack with you. Uh, who's going to fire off for us this week? So I've got a little hack for you to help clean the nozzle at the end of the airbrush. Now, obviously, lots of airbrushes are very different. Um, I typically use, I, I do use a, an Evolution, so I'm used to harder and steam back. But, um, but there's lots of airbrushes that do have very similar nozzle aspects that just go on the front in front of the needle. Um, it's going to be a bit of a strange segue into a different industry, which is the dental industry. But uh, shout out our listener who does the, uh, the dentures. Yeah, 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 the yeah. <laughs> they will know exactly what I'm about to talk about. Um, but the interdental brushes that you use to clean between your teeth and in between your gums, they're tiny little brushes that have got like almost like a really soft nylon uh, kind of like almost like a pipe cleaner, but for your mouth. That's the best way for me to explain. Is that it. like the little plasticky <laughs> yeah. needle toothpick? Correct, Amundo. Yeah. yeah. They are phenomenal. Uh, Joe's, Joe's, Joe's <laughs> keeling over there. Almost Hello. like a pipe cleaner, but yeah. for your mouth. They are. It's like a pipe cleaner for your mouth. Um, but they are they are amazing at cleaning your nozzle out. So yes, you can use. I've got like a thing that's made by Harder and Steamback, which is like a, a, a nozzle. They're little brushes but, almost. They're quite yeah. similar, really. They're quite Some similar. Different sizes. They're like the same thing, but longer. They're longer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're quite good. But I find that the nylon threads or the, the nylon materials on there, they're quite quite coarse and obviously the inside the airbrush i don't want to go too crazy but in the in the body or in the barrel whatever you want to call it you've got some some uh, plastic abs or pbs uh like um washers and things like that i find those bigger ones they can be quite abrasive and sometimes can like damage potentially the plastic for abrasion and things like that so i actually use those incidental brushes because 
for, for cleaning my airbrush and cleaning the nozzle and stuff because they are designed to go in a human mouth, which is supposed to be delicate, you know. Um, I guess they're also like more precise because they're smaller. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I use those all the time for cleaning like the nozzle and cleaning like just in the barrel or cleaning just in any part of the airbrush. I find them really useful. Um, and then, yeah, yeah just, just don't get mixed up the ones you're using for your teeth and the ones yeah, you're using for the airbrush. Yeah. Don't chop and change. Yeah, yeah don't chop and change. I guess that's like a little uh, mini cost-saving hack that as well because those are... Quite cheap, like buy those in a big pack, but the airbrush cleaning tools are yeah. 32p not super cheap. from Boots or Savers. Yeah. Yeah. Good little hack. Yeah. Like, round us out. Yeah, Thank nice. you, everyone, for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. Please, please, please do us a huge favor and leave us a rating or review if you're listening on the audio platforms or if you're watching on YouTube. Please do subscribe to the channel, especially if you like to listen to this episode every week. You may not realize that you are not subscribed. So, thank you, everyone. We will catch you next week. <laughs>